Hello and welcome to section 7.5 of the OpenStax Chemistry text. Today we'll be discussing the strengths of ionic and covalent bonds. So, we've gone about describing these ionic bonds, right, when the electrons are transferred, cation, anion, electrostatic interactions bringing them together. We've got the covalent bonds in which they share the electrons in an electron pair in a bond. You can have a single bond, a double bond that has four electrons, a triple bond that has six electrons. Now, we're going to compare the different strengths of ionic and covalent bonds and learn about the energy of those bonds, the energy and the strength of those bonds. So, a bond's strength describes how strongly each atom is joined to another atom. So the strength of the bond is how much energy it is going to take to break those atoms apart, to break the bond. So what we're going to be learning about then is the bond strength of covalent bonds, and we will compare that to the strength of the ionic bonds. Now remember, we don't have ionic molecule. We don't have, well, we have ionic molecules, polyatomic ions, right? But we don't have the, the ionic structures, ionic solids, are not molecular. Instead, they have a lattice structure. They've got a crystal, they've got a, a lattice structure that is spread throughout, um, right? In which you don't have a sodium chloride molecule, you have a bunch of sodium and chlorines that are all um, uh, attracted to the nearest neighbors, right? And so you have the ratio of one sodium to one chlorine, yet you don't actually have little molecules of sodium and chlorine. Okay, so first off, covalent bonds. Okay. Now, covalent bonds, um, stable molecules exist because covalent bonds hold the atoms together. They hold these atoms together into a little mo molecule, right? And we measure the strength of this bond by the energy that is required to break it in order to actually separate those two atoms, right? We have the two atoms. How hard, how much energy must go into breaking those atoms apart? The stronger the bond, the greater the energy required to break it. And it always requires energy to break the bond. The amount of energy to break the bond is called the bond energy or the bond dissociation energy because we're dissociating those atoms from one another. So for a diatomic molecule, which you would say just for some diatomic molecule, that's a molecule between the atoms X and Y, this is defined, the bond energy for this is defined as the standard enthalpy change for the following reaction in which we have x, y in the gas phase. So we have this diatomic molecule, x and y, right, right here in the gaseous phase, and we break it up into x and y. That amount of energy that is required for breaking it, uh, the, the, the standard is called the standard enthalpy change and is given the symbol dxy. So as a, as a real example, so this is um, this is the standard enthalpy change uh, what am I wanting to say here? Um, and an enthalpy change for a diatomic molecule dxy the bond dissociation energy X, Y as a gas breaks up into X as a gas plus Y as a gas. And this bond dissociation energy, D, X, Y, is equal to delta H naught. And it's the breaking up of those things. Four, 
the bond energy for a hydrogen molecule, and so we would see here that we have that as DHH, this is 436 kilojoules per mole of bonds broken. So if we have one mole, it's going to require 436 kilojoules to break that bond. If we have two moles, it will require twice that amount. If we have 0.5, it would require half that amount. Now, molecules with three or more atoms have two or more bonds. The more atoms you have connected to each other, the more bonds. And, therefore, in order to break apart all of those atoms, we would have to break apart all of those bonds. And so in breaking apart all of those bonds, we have to add together the amount of energy it takes to break all of the bonds. So what do we say then? The sum of all bond energies in a molecule is equal to the standard enthalpy change for the endothermic reaction, right? We're having to put energy in to break these things apart for the endothermic reaction that breaks all of the bonds in the molecule. As an example, here we have methane. Methane we see, we've got it in its gaseous phase. If we wanted to break all of the bonds up for methane, we would wind up with a carbon and four hydrogens. Well, this is going to be equal to the sum of all of the bond energies. And each of these bonds is a carbon-hydrogen bond. So, um, the sum of these is 1,660 kilojoules, and that relates to breaking up all of these bonds. So we could then say then, right, that CH, right, we have to break four CH bonds. Four CH bonds must be broken. Carbon, hydrogen, right? Must be broken. And this has a delta H naught for this going to, sorry, for this going to a carbon gaseous plus four hydrogen gaseous. Right? This has a delta H that is equal to 1660 kilojoules for one mole. Right? Four carbon hydrogen bonds must be broken and so we would say that the bond energy for breaking one carbon hydrogen bond would be equal to delta H naught divided by four which is 1660 kilojoules divided by four so D, C dash H, the bond dissociation energy for a carbon hydrogen bond is, uh, well, I can just look at it over here and don't have to do the, uh, it's 415, is that, is that right? Let's see, four goes into 16 four times. And then we've got 60, 4 goes into 6 one time, that's 20 left over, that's 5 times, 415 kilojoules. Okay, now, that's a little bit of a simplification, right? Because we're, we are breaking up all these bonds and we've got 415 kilojoules for one mole. And there, are, because when we divide that by 4, right? Uh, we, we divide the 1660 by 4 to get that. Now, although the four bonds are equivalent in this original molecule, we first must break that first bond. And in breaking that first bond, that requires 439 kilojoules per mole. The remaining bonds, however, are easier to break because after we've ripped off that first hydrogen, we've got a less stable thing left behind. And so those other bonds are going to be easier to break. And so although the first one requires 439 kilojoules per mole, the average is given by the 415 kilojoules per mole. Okay? So this is not the exact value to break 
one bond, it's the average value to break all of these bonds. Now, how do we compare the strengths of covalent bonds? So the strength of a bond between atoms increases as the number of electron pairs in the bond increases. So a double bond is stronger than a single bond. A triple bond is stronger than a double bond. So as the bond strength increases, the bond length decreases. As the amount of energy that is holding these things together increases, because that's what it is, it's the amount of energy that is trapped within that bond, the amount of energy that must be overcome in order to break that bond, well, the stronger the bond, the shorter the bond. So we have a triple bond, a double bond, and a single bond. So that's the way we need to think of this, right? So triple bonds are stronger and shorter, double bonds are stronger and shorter than single bonds, and single bonds have the weakest and all the longest. So, in the table down below, we have some average bond energies and we can then compare these, uh, these bond energies. Now, when one atom bonds to various atoms in a group, the bond strength typically decreases as we move down the group. Why is this going to be? Well, as we move down, we're getting bigger, right? We've got these bigger molecules, so we can, if we can compare, um, let's see, which one do we want to go with? Here we go. Carbon and chlorine, that's 330. Well, chlorine is fairly small. We've even got, do we have carbon and chlorine on here? Um, carbon and chlorine, 439. That's a lot of energy, right? Well, let's think of that. Carbon and fluorine are both fairly small. They're in the very first row, so they're both fairly small. They'll be closer to one another. Carbon and chlorine, well, chlorine's quite a bit bigger, and we see that it's a little bit further away. It's got a slower bond energy. Carbon and bromine, it's, a, you know, bromine's even bigger. Carbon and iodine, it has a lower bond energy. It's easier to break those bonds as we attach the same thing going down a group. But here we've got a lot of bond energies that are you know, listed out and I'm going to guess you probably have some homework questions that are going to concern these and this table is going to be very useful. Now if we look in the back of the book in the uh... oh nope not this book I thought I had it in here nope what's the other book I was using okay um so this is a good big table full of bond energies the kilojoules per mole so those would be the units for any of these energies that are listed now here we give an average bond lengths and bond energies for some common bonds. So some bonds that you may likely run across. Carbon and carbon. Bond length, this is a single bond, 1.54, so it's 1.54 angstroms. The bond energy is 345. Now we look at a carbon-carbon double bond, we see that the bond length has decreased and the bond energy has increased. So can write down a few rules here. I'm going to use blue this time. As bond, as, as the number of bonds, of bonding electrons between two atoms increases the bond energy increases and the bond length decreases and so we can say that for a single bond this has a 
Uh, let's see here. If we're doing uh, bond energy, bond energy, single is less than a double is less than a triple. Okay? For bond length, a single is longer than a double, is longer than a triple. A triple is the shortest of those. And we can see that represented in this chart, called a nitrogen single, 1.43 to 90. Shorter, stronger. Shorter, even stronger. Now, why is this important? Well, we can use the amount of energy it takes to break these bonds to calculate the approximate enthalpy changes. Here we go, back to chapter, uh, back to chapter 5 in the thermodynamics, right? We're talking about this idea of enthalpy, the idea of the amount of energy, right? Remember, H is equal to U plus PV. And we've got this, we can, we can use these bond energies. This is the energy that is trapped in those bonds, the energy that is represented by those bonds. Right, which is the enthalpy. We can use the bond energies to calculate approximate enthalpy changes for reactions where enthalpies of formation are not available. So if we don't have the enthalpy of formation, if it's difficult to uh, do experimentally perhaps, or if we're trying to work, if we're working with a compound that is new and that hasn't been studied before, we can approximate that based upon the bond connections that are there. Also, if we do have the enthalpies, and we can then use the enthalpies and the calculated bond energies in order to you know, do some approximations as to whether or not it actually has the structure that we think it has. So, these sort of calculations for reactions, right? These calculations can also help tell us whether a reaction is exothermic or endothermic. How? Well, an exothermic reaction results when the bonds in the product are stronger. <coughs> are str an exothermic reaction happens when the bonds in the product are stronger than the bonds in the reactants. An endothermic reaction, this is when delta H is positive, heat is absorbed. This happens when the bonds in the products are weaker than those in the reactants. That it actually took energy in in order to make the products happen. So, right, and so when we think of this, this is conservation of energy. We're talking about whether the bonds in the products versus the bonds in the reactants. If the reactants have stronger, bo stronger bonds, more energy in those bonds than in the products, then heat had to have been absorbed. Okay, so the enthalpy change for a chemical reaction is going to be approximately equal to the sum of the energy required to break all the bonds in the reactants plus the energy released when all the bonds are formed in the products. So let's see if I can give you an example of this using lockers. Okay. Here we have this molecule and this molecule. I would have to put energy in in order to break that bond. And I would put energy in in order to break that bond. Now, when I form this new molecule, energy is being released. And when I form this new molecule, energy is going to be released. What we're looking at is whether or not the energy that is released is greater than the energy that went into breaking the bonds. If the energy that is released when the new bonds form is greater than the energy that went into breaking the bonds, it's an exothermic reaction. If, however, the energy that is released when the new bonds form is less than the energy that went into breaking the bonds, it's an endothermic reaction. Okay, so 
what are we doing? We're comparing the bond energy of the reactants to the bond energy of the products. And we're doing a delta, a final minus initial. Right? Delta H is the sum, so that's the sigma, you meaning sum, the summation of the bonds that are broken minus the bonds that are formed. Now, this number, this energy, is th this bond energy, that's always going to be a positive energy. That is the amount of energy that it takes to break those bonds. Here we're subtracting that positive, right? So here we've got the bonds that are broken minus the bonds that are formed. We've got Okay. So how do we do this? Well, for a reaction. Let's 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 go with this reaction right here. H2 plus Cl2 goes to 2HCl. Right. We've got hydrogen gas plus chlorine gas goes to hydrogen chloride gas. So what are we doing? We've got hydrogen gas plus chlorine goes to HCl and HCl. The delta H is equal to the summation of the bonds formed minus the sum of the bonds, um, to make sure I've got this right. Now, now I was back, you see? And that's what I get for checking myself, I'm correcting myself. Delta H is equal to the sum of the energy, the bond energy for the bonds broken minus the summation for the energy of the bonds formed. Okay, well which bonds are being broken over here? Which bonds are being formed? That's these over here. If we go to that table, we will see that HH bonds, oh yeah, HH, this is D is equal to 436 for that bond. For CLCL, chlorine, chlorine, uh, that should be on the bottom of this second. Nope, not, not there. Ah, here we go, 243. And HCl should be right here. Yep, that's 432. Okay. Well then, the bonds that are broken are these. So these are the reactants. That's going to be 436 plus 243 minus the summation of the bonds that are formed. Well, there's two of those. So that's two times 432 and, and we're subtracting that amount let's see if we've set it up as they do 436 plus 243 minus 2 times 432 and we wind up with negative 185 kilojoules and this is the delta H for that reaction. This is the calculated delta H for that reaction. But what does this mean? This means that the products have less energy inside of them than the reactants. They have less enthalpy than the reactants, right? That U plus PV, that H for these is less than the enthalpy for the reactants. Well, therefore, it's going to have lost energy. Energy will have been released. It will be exothermic. And 
this gives us then, um, we can compare this to the standard molar enthalpy of formation of hydrochloric acid, which is 92.307. We multiply that by two because what are we doing here? Well, we're forming hydro well, not hydrochloric acid, sorry, hydrogen chloride. We're forming hydrogen chloride from its uh, elemental constituents. The delta H formation for uh, for HCl is given by one half H2 plus one half Cl2, one half hydrogen gas plus one half chlorine gas, as they all standard, right? Goes to one mole of hydrogen chloride, and this delta H formation for that. Delta H formation is equal to 92.307 kilojoules per mole. Well, this is for one mole. If we multiply that by two, we get, oh, this is a negative, sorry. We multiply that by two, we get a negative 184.6 kilojoules. And look at that. Uh, that, this is the calculated value from these bond energies, and this is the, the enthalpy of formation. Look at how close those things are to one another. Okay, so as an example for another one, we've got carbon monoxide reacting with hydrogen gas forming methanol. Well, in methanol, so we've learned how to draw these structures out, and so let us look at these structures and having drawn the Lewis dot structure, what do we see? Well, we see this is a CO triple bond. We see that we have two hydrogen, hydrogen bonds and then over here is where it gets a little bit more complicated. So what we need to do is and to start writing this out, I'm going to use blue this time. C O H H H H, and this is going to okay. I suppose I can finish out my little start structure there. Ugly ugly. What do we need to do? We need to go up to this table. We see that this is 2 times 436. This is a carbon oxygen triple bond. Right here, that's 1080. What do we have over here? Well, we have three carbon hydrogens. And these are each going to be three carbon hydrogens. Uh, we had that something 415, right? Uh, do we not? Ah, there it is. 415. So this is 415, that's that one, that one, that one. Then we have a carbon oxygen, CO, it's right here. That one is 350. Okay. So we've got 415 times three. Okay. So those are those three, we've broken that one now. And oxygen and hydrogen, right here 464 so that is oxygen and hydrogen is 464 we add those together we add these two together 1080 plus 2 times 436 and I forgot my calculator 
over there in my book bag and I'm too lazy to walk over across the room and get the calculator, but we see that we've set this up in the same manner. 1080 plus 2 times 436. These are the bonds broken. And this represents, especially this side, right? These are the bonds formed. We do bonds broken minus bonds form the energy of those bonds. We find out that the delta H here is equal to negative 107, negative 107 kilojoules per mole. We calculate, calculate, we compare this to the value of the delta H formation from the table. Right, in which we had the delta H formation of the table in the back of the book, in which we were able to do delta H for reaction is equal to the sum of the mole weighted delta H formation of the products minus the sum of the mole weighted delta H formation of the reactants. That and we compare that and we find that this delta H reaction is negative 90.5 kilojoules. And what do we see? Well, there's a little bit of a difference. Why? Well, remember, those D values, those, these dissociation, these bond, bond dissociation values are on average of breaking those bonds. We have to take into account that there's other stuff going on here. There's, there's, the bond strengths actually are affected by the other things that are connected. Okay? So they get a rough agreement, but at the same time, that's pretty good. I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's like 15% difference there, but it's still, it's pretty good. Hey, my shirt has come unbuttoned there. Okay. So, hopefully that, that has made sense. It's a sit there and you plug and chug, all right? You draw out the Lewis star diagrams, you identify the bonds that are broken, the bonds that are formed, you add up the energies for each of those types, and then subtract the bonds broken energy minus the bonds formed energy. So that's covalent bonds. Now we have ionic bond strength with this idea of lattice energy. So, an ionic compound is stable because the electrostatic energy between the positive and negative ions, right? We've got these positive ions, we've got the negative ions, and they cancel each other out. Now, the lattice energy of a compound is a measure of the strength of this attraction. Remember, we're not talking about molecules, we're talking about compounds. We don't have little ionic molecules like that. Oh. Yes, right? We're talking about compounds. Compounds that are made up of cations and anions. Okay, and they're in a, they're in a lattice structure. So the lattice energy of a compound is a measure of the strength of that electrostatic attraction. Lattice energy, the delta H lattice of an ionic compound is going to be then defined as the energy required to separate one mole of the solid into its component, this is important, component gaseous ions. So, for a very general form of what that, what that statement is saying, we've got a solid ionic compound and we break it up into its gaseous forms and the energy that goes into doing that is the lattice energy. Okay. So, our lattice energies are going to be endothermic, right? It's going, we're taking a solid and breaking it up into gaseous ions. We're ripping these things apart from one another. So therefore, it's going to take energy in to do that, which means that those things, after we've ripped them apart, will have more energy than the reactants. And so our delta H values will be positive the enthalpy of the products will be higher than the enthalpy of the reactants. Okay, that is the, how we define it in this textbook. Some texts 
years about forming the solid from the gaseous ions and that would give a negative value and so just make sure whenever you go to reference the material use the use the references that are provided for the book here yeah but whenever you go to look up values make sure that you understand how they're going about defining it because this is all about convention the convention that's being used make sure you understand that convention <clears throat> so for sodium fluoride the enthalpy, the lattice enthalpy is 769 kilojoules. That means that if we have one mole of salt, table salt, we have one mole of table salt, it will take 769 kilojoules of energy to separate that into the sodium cations and the chlorine anions in their gaseous forms. Okay? Stated the other way, when we have one mole of gaseous chlorine and gaseous uh, sodium, so chloride and sodium cations coming together to form salt, that much energy will be released. Okay. Now, to express this as the following, we've got a, this is sort of, you know, this is from Coulomb's law, right? governing the forces between electric forces in which the energy is going to be equal to C. That's a constant that depends upon the type of crystal structure. It's dependent upon how these things are arranged in three dimensional space. Then we have Z plus and Z minus. This is the charge of the cation and the charge of the anion, respectively, right? And all not down here, this is the interionic distance. This is the sum of the radii of the positive and the negative ions. You add up the negative and the positive, and you're getting the distance between one nucleus and the other. Okay. So the lattice energy of the ionic crystal increases as the charges of the as the charges of the ions increase and the size of the ions decrease, right? As the radius gets smaller, the lattice energy goes up. As this gets, goes up, this goes up. As this goes up, this goes up. All right, so just make sure that you're able to look at that equation and understand how a change in the charge or change in the size would affect the enthalpy of the lattice structure. Okay, so different interatomic distances will produce different, la different lattice energies. Right? So we could have two things, we could have uh, two things that are both plus two and minus two, yet have different sizes. So we could say, um, oh, let's go plus one and minus one. Sodium chloride and um, potassium bromide both have the same charges. Yet, sodium chloride, sodium and chlorine are both smaller than potassium and bromide, right? Because they're located higher up on the periodic table. Remember our periodic trends from chapter seven, chapter six. Um, and since the internuclear distance between potassium and bromide is bigger, that means that the lattice energy is going to be less than the lattice energy of uh, sodium chloride. Okay, so as an example, and just doing a comparison, ruby is aluminum oxide, contains traces of chromium. It's, uh, yeah, it's get yeah, chromium in some of the, the places there. The compound aluminum, aluminum selenide, selen selenide, I think, is used in the fabrication of some semiconductor devices which will have a larger lattice energy. Aluminum oxide or aluminum selenide, I think. So, well, let's see. Aluminum and aluminum have the same charge. Oxygen and, and selenium are in the same, um, same column, so they have the same charge. However, oxygen is smaller. And since it's smaller, the internuclear distance on this is going to be 
smaller than the internuclear distance of this, right? that, that the distance between the atoms is going to be smaller in this than in this, which means that this one will take more energy to break. So therefore, Al2O3 would have the larger lattice energy. Okay, that's what I'm going to give you for this section, and then we will review the Born-Haber cycle in another video. See you then.